Uh, well, welcome to the sixth and final lecture in this series of the Grace Machine, uh, which brings us to our most most radical figure, I want to say, um, which uh, as for, as cannot be further removed from the notion of standing, which is of course our central figure standing, and then we had jumping, hanging, floating, and now falling, and all these four letter uh, ones that are re directly related to standing, or else it wouldn't be a, an argument of grace. Of course, uh, we're not doing a phenomenology of, of postures, um, but but the word falling uh, is extreme because it relates to, again, the gap, uh, in this case the void, but also death, um, and to chance, because of course the, the word chance means uh, falling, it's uh, directly derived from the notion of falling, the, the, the Latin casus, so um, um, we should actually uh, uh, look at the contents, um, we will again divide it up in, in two parts, um, the, the first part, the first four sections uh, I have titled, uh, I have titled accident, and, and the letter four I have titled uh, a Reckoning. Um, so we'll just be uh, talking about the, the, the first part uh, today, um, um, which will, which will uh, 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 go over the notion of the, of the five postures and the five figures, because I've been asking myself for a very long time why I've actually started to, uh, to work with five figures and, and not with four or six or 17. Um, and I, I think I found a structure that uh, that can tell us something about uh, a wider f five. Um, and then uh, uh, there's a, a, a section titled the gap. Um, it's actually the sixth the sixth time we discussed that subject. In this case, it's uh, gravity and grace is a title of uh, Simone Weil's book. Um, uh, her book, uh, from, of course, it was not her book, it was a posthumous book, but it, um, from the 1940s. Um, uh, I have to like, finally discuss this because it's, uh, it's, uh, it relates to my own book, obviously, Grace and Gravity, which has the reverse title. Uh, so I'll be explaining like uh, uh, why I reversed the title, but also like what my relationship is to uh, Simone Veil, bo uh, uh, Simone Veil's bo uh, work, um, and that will also bring us to uh, uh, notions of uh, of uh, of grace uh, with figures as uh, like like Leibniz and, and Pascal, and these all relate to that sort of similar notion of uh, of the gap and the void. Um, that, that and that will bring us to uh, what I call the, the, the third section on media, which is not about media at all. It's about uh, the, the Latin, uh, the, the Roman poet uh, Lucretius, um, but it is related to media and accident and uh, and the em emission of images. Um, and and then we'll close uh, with uh, with Paul Virilio again. Uh, it's the second time we discuss Virilio. And, um, and how accident relates to substance and, and, and technology. So that will be uh, our, our work for today. Um, it uh, it's, uh, will be quite long, I think. Um, it uh, it's, uh, starts with accident. As I said, uh, the word accident uh, 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 um, relates to falling, um, like chance. Um, uh, it actually means uh, falling or falling to or to fall. Uh, accident is, uh, uh, is from cadere, like the same like decadence or incident or coincidence. Uh, all these words relate to uh, to cadere, like like casus, um, and of course casus uh, a, a case uh, means chance, but it also uh, the word case is derived from casus. Um, so the, the, this opens up a whole can of, of very complex relations. Uh, we, we started like uh, um, with our discussion of realism in, uh, with the figure of standing, of course, uh, with the idea of things. Um, in this case, it's, it's similar, but uh, from, a, from a different angle, uh, because the, the word case in German is uh, der Fall, der Fall. Um, which we know from Nietzsche's book, uh, Der Fall Wagner, which is a very, a, a, a very vile uh, 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 construction. It's not, it, it doesn't mean just the, 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 the case of Wagner. It actually also means that the, the, well, almost a pathological case, Der Fall Wagner. And of course, it means the fall of Wagner. 
Uh, so in German the word "fall" and and that's that's similar in uh, in Dutch "geval" uh, relates to things and, and how does that work? Uh, der fall um, in du in Dutch "geval," which is the case of the zaak and the zaak is uh, der sache in German and sache is shows in French and uh, shows in, uh, means thing. So what we have here is a, is a, is um, the thing not as an object, but as an, as an event, as something that happens, an occurrence, and uh, as something that befalls. Let's let's say it like that. And uh, and I think that's a sort of the, we get to the heart of uh, of what grace is, because grace directly uh, relates objects to events, uh, and we know that from the word thing as well. But uh, it's important to say because uh, we argue that things uh, stand, stand by themselves in in a groundless manner. In a groundless manner, that's important to say. In this, and in, in this case, this the, the their fall, uh, the case uh, that relates to things and uh, things being discussed uh, by us in assemblies. Remember that we discussed that uh, in, in in the very first lecture on, on standing. Um, relates back to uh, to the object and uh, and things but in, in the form of a, of the event itself so i think this will really sort of conclude um, the, this whole trajectory we making between objects and, and movement objects and events and how actually grace constructs that um now uh, uh, let's look again at the five postures um uh, 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 that's, these are the images that, well, the first four are the images uh, I've used to, uh, well, I wouldn't even say illustrate, but to actually use them as, as figures of standing, jumping, hanging, and floating. And uh, the horse played a role, and the dolphins played a role, and the orangutan played a role, this notion of dependence and independence, and, and of course the octopus played a very important role in, in the notion of, uh, of, of floating and how it related to media and the idea of consciousness. And the strange thing is that we get to, the, to, to falling and uh, there's no animal. There's no animal. It's, it is, there's, uh, there's actually uh, t two human beings, a man and a woman, being cast from paradise. Well, almost, because uh, she's about to, to pluck, the, to pluck the, the apple from the tree. But why is it a, a, a human figure and, and not an animal? And uh, th that's uh, uh, it's quite telling because, uh, of course, animals uh, get killed by accidents um, uh, and they're being killed by each other. And uh, so in that sense, uh, they have accidents. Um, they can triple and they can fall, and not as often as we do, uh, obviously, but... Um, uh, they, it's very specific to uh, human beings to uh, to fall, and, and why is that? Well, um, my theory of uh, of uh, of uh, the fall of man, uh, of uh, of being cast from paradise, um, which I discussed many many lectures uh, before, is is not has does not have any uh, sexual uh, b background, but it's it's really about the not fitting of humans. In nature, it's about the softness of their feet and uh, and the softness of their hands. And they don't have claws; they don't have uh, hooves, uh, so they don't properly fit in what I call foot space. They don't properly fit in hand space, like the orangutan, which seems to have like uh, four hands instead of two hands and two feet, um, or like the, the four hooves of the of the horse. Um, which is so perfectly made for for the for the for the planes, um, so we don't fit, and uh, that uh, we've discussed this uh, uh, quite extensively. But uh, there is no pure human, and this is an idea that we derived from uh, not from Stiegler, of course. The Stiegler uh, discusses it as well, but the Stiegler Stiegler got it from uh, André Leroy Gouron. Uh, from the 1940s and 50s, and uh, he was very clear that uh, there's no natural state of, of humans. There's, it's impossible, uh, uh, and it, it means that that not fitting of uh, of humans uh, uh, 
means this opening up to technology. So there's simply no humans without uh, things. There's no humans without tools. And, uh, and that's that's how it opens up uh, to, to, to the notion of the fall. So we already get a very complex link here between technology, humans, and uh, accident or, or falling. So that's, uh, that, that, that's an idea we have to keep in our minds because uh, we'll return to it like uh, uh, pretty often. So it's, uh, it, it, we will have to check how this works. And, and of course, when we discussed the, the, ho the horse, we got to uh, the notion of groundless standing uh, via contrapposto and uh, to, to a notion of jumping. We saw ju uh, we saw uh, break dancers and we saw uh, 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 skateboarders jumping and uh, in in uh, in the embodiment of stance and uh, so that th that was already a, a chiastic move and then we had the same with uh, with jumping that became a form of floating uh, through uh, photography mainly uh, the idea of the uh, temporal punto the, the given moment. Uh, this, the same with floating, of course, with uh, not just being groundless, but you could also say an all-around ground. So again, it becomes a, a form of hanging. And hanging, uh, of course, being first de as a, like a physically dependent on, on, uh, on, this, on structure, on this uh, notion of standing. But then uh, stance transfigured and became uh, became a radiating structure, and an ornament actually be became uh, uh, something that that uh, made structure instead of being dependent on structure. So all these figures uh, transform in each other in a very specific way, um, and uh, that that's that became uh, quite extreme. Uh, the standing, of course, being groundless, so that's a, a notion of falling. The jumping, of course, uh, becoming a form of 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 uh, of, of mimesis, um, and uh, all these figures started to like interrelate more and more, and uh, uh, and I I tried to do this with images, um, but that doesn't work at all. It doesn't work at all because it doesn't explain like what what the exact relationships are. Uh, so we we have been like interrelating the figures to each other, but we haven't like give them a, a, a given them a, a, a proper structure. It, it's of course it uh, we have said at the beginning um, contraposto is the central figure. It's the it's really our model of of the figure in its sense of uh, of the gaiastic structure and bootstrapping, holding itself from the ground, and this notion of groundless standing. So that's the central figure, and these other four relate to that, and they relate to each other, but but not in the same way as they relate to uh, standing. So and that's how we got to this um, um, this diagram. Um, uh, I didn't have this diagram at the beginning of the lecture, so I, I needed to sort of figure it out myself during the discussions. Uh, but but um, um, it it does tell us um, uh, um, something about how how this seems to work. So we got standing in the middle, but it is a groundless standing, um, a groundless standing that. Uh, is at the center of a, of a double axis, uh, the, an axis of gravity and, and an axis of anti-gravity, anti-grav. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember when we discussed uh, uh, Heinrich von Kleist, he used uh, when, we, when he spoke about the, the, the theater of marionettes, um, about anti-grav, uh, a word you can hardly find in German, but uh, it, there's this notion of, of grace being uh, anti-gravity. It's by I mean my argument that we cannot exactly uh, uh, put grace in a, in a in a dialectic structure with uh, with gravity. That's not the case at all. Uh, uh, but both gravity and anti gravity are in a structure that uh, that involves grace or or grace that is made up of both because grace manages gravity, and it's true that there is a form of of of. Uh, of uh, 
of lightening or uh, of, of a movement against heaviness or uh, seriousness or uh, or dignity all those words that are related to uh, uh, gravitas um, um, but it it has to be understood as as a device or as a machinery that always relates both so grace itself is not an anti-gravity but it is something that um, places itself in in a sort of fourfold or in this case a fivefold uh, of uh, of uh, at least a biaxial system where standing is in the middle but standing is made up of uh, in the gray structure of, of gravity and anti-gravity and and so it is with the other four so jumping uh, relates to anti-gravity and floating to anti-gravity and hanging relates to gravity and falling of course uh, um, relates to to gravity so we get uh, we, we we now have a structure where where the the four are are not in a matrix but they're actually much much clearer in their structure um in their relationships to each other especially with standing in the middle that means that all of these four via their axes have a direct relationship to standing right so the, the, the jumping is not just a figure in itself it's it's chiastic structure that relates directly to standing and the same with floating and the same with hanging of course we explained that like yeah, of course hanging that seems to depend on standing but it also transfigures that what stands and makes it radiate and so it is with all the other figures it will be the same with falling and we saw the same with jumping uh, that it became this uh, this uh, uh, almost this this moment out outside of time and uh, as a standstill and the same with floating and they relate to each other as well but in in a sort of less fixed relationships um, so this is this is the structure that we've uh, we, uh, we, which probably sort of uh, is behind um, the, the the fact that I, I chose these five figures uh, f from the beginning and uh, uh, there's a relationship with uh, with uh, 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 gravity and and religion and I think we have to be clear there um, it's uh, it, <laughs> it's quite clear that all religions have a very specific relationship to gravity I've, i think i called them uh, gravity experts in the in the grace and gravity book um but it is specific why is that because the gravity of course relates to anything we undergo it's a form of undergoing and, and a form of bearing uh, and, and um, of course religion always uh, religion I have, to, I have to say has a very specific relationship to the grace machine and, and many of the terms that we find in uh, in, uh, in in religion and it's not just Christian religion though it seems to be like be about Christian religion here um, it's also other religions they all relate to uh, 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 gravity and uh, and and they all make use of uh, of the grace machine and um, of course i'm not not an expert in hinduism i'm not an expert in is islam but it is uh, the, the 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 word grace uh, occurs in all these religions it's prasada in uh, in hinduism and it's rama in 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 the islam i i i, I don't have enough knowledge to uh, to uh, discuss any of these uh, religions um though it's clear that for instance in hinduism posture plays a very important role um and not and not just through yoga but also like in the depiction of the of the gods uh, and, and the gods are often also uh, god uh, yeah human animals uh, uh, so uh, uh, the, 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 the configurations that we use to uh, explain figures uh, are, are prominent in, in Hinduism. Also the notion of dancing, the notion of contraposto exists uh, in Hinduism, the Tribana. Um, so that that's very very extensive and I, I just have an, I don't have enough sort of expertise to, to explain and, and uh, treat this properly so I just keep on like uh, uh, 
relating it to Christianity, I, I think it's important. Uh, I will slowly uh, explain uh, what my relationship is to Christianity and also the, the figures that I'll be discussing the, the, uh, the, or the characters that play a role here, Simone Weil, uh, Leibniz and, and Pascal are, are all uh, uh, Christians and, um, and even theologists. So uh, th 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 there's, there's no uh, way we can get around the whole idea of, uh, of religion being related to, uh, to gravity. And I think it's, it's important to say because um, they're very specific practices and um, they all relate to, let's say, how, how, how grace can... Uh, 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 deal with gravity and, and uh, they have very specific ideas on, on how what what the mechanism is um, so we already see uh, the, the top Christ hanging we discussed that in relationship to uh, the, to the hanging figure and ornament and we actually called Christ the absolute the absolute ornament the serpentine figure uh, um, um, hanging from the cross, but not saying that the, that figure is actually Christ itself. No, it's the fig, figura crucis. That means that it's, we have to look at the serpentine figure of the body as well as the as the as the the the, the, the X-shaped or the the, the T-shaped figure there, uh, of the, of the of the wooden cross. We have to like look at both and how one transforms the other. Um, but now we get to the, the, the fall of man, um, which is uh, in, in, uh, in, in Christianity is, is a central idea. Um, um, yeah, it's inherent, and um, I, I don't think that's a specifically in, uh, a Christian idea. Uh, of course, it, uh, mm, it's a it, it it's a central idea. The original sin uh, is the central idea of, of of Christianity, and it and it has to do with uh, with the notion of debt, and uh, and uh, so it almost like reverses the the, the, the gift cycle because uh, humans are now cannot just like await the gift, but they're in such a debt that they have to await forgiveness. So uh, it's it's a very specific reversal of the of the gift cycle um, which I'm not going to discuss today but it's uh, it's important to say um, so from our from our point of view uh, that means from the from the viewpoint of the grace machine I think we have to discuss uh, the, the fall of man or the, the casting from paradise as this sort of notion of not fitting and, and the leading of technical lives um, so that 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 means something because it 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 means that um, the history of man is uh, is actually a history of technology and um, and that changes things because uh, um, I think and with with Hegel's idea of history, I, I'm just thinking also of Michel Serre who said that uh, animals. Uh, I think he actually discussed the the crab. He actually mentioned the crab. Um, that they don't have any history. Only man has a history, and uh, that, that's a, that's a, if you, if you leave out the sort of the concept of evolution, but uh, the, the 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 construction of history and the way it is structured, he might might have a very important point, and it has to do with this uh, this idea of uh, of technology as uh, as as uh, our extension or or our transformation. Especially within the ideas of uh, of Hegel, if we actually follow Hegel, um, um, as uh, in in how he structured history, the most important uh, central argument is that of lordship and bondage, the dialectic of of man and slaves, um, Herrschaft und Knechtschaft, um, which uh, we of course uh, always relate to. Uh, to um, capitalism and uh, and uh, sort of the, the exploitation and, and repression of uh, of the workers and slaves and put it in a sort of master slave relationship that might all be true but in a technological uh, framework and this is actually a, a, a larger idea because technology has also always been understood as uh, serving 
And uh, if that dialectic becomes ambiguous, as we argued before, if the, if the slave becomes the master and the master becomes the slave, there's this constant ambiguity. And of course, that, that's important or else there wouldn't be a figure. It's a chiastic structure and they're both the one is what the, the one that is prosthetic is also the one that becomes mimetic. So we always get this sort of uh, 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 looping figure. If that's not specifically a, a human relationship, but a human uh, relationship with technology, uh, that uh, then things start to like change completely because that means that uh, the, the 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 history of of man or the history of uh, of spirit or the history of spirit is actually a technological history and um, and. Um, and that relates to falling. Uh, this is very dark um, because that means that the fall of man and uh, man becoming technological and uh, and uh, that technology then has again an interest in accident and, and, uh, and falling makes it a sort of a loop and uh, uh, which stands by itself. And uh, that, I think that that means something for for history. Uh, that we might actually have to rewrite history as a, as a history of uh, of technology, and uh, it, it's not an idea I want to extend too much on, on expand too much on uh, at the moment. But um, in, in 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 the perspective of the of the grace machine, the fall of man uh, be, be becomes a, 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 a technological history, and uh, that that might become a could could become like a, a whole set of ideas in in itself. Um, that's not what I want to do today, and I, I, I would really like to uh, discuss the work of uh, Simone. Uh, Weil. I'm always saying Weil because it's a scarf. I think the family of Simone Weil should say V um, in French. It's uh, they're, they're from the Alsace, uh, the Alsacian Jews. Um, and that's the German part of France, and uh, the, 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 of course the the the, the, the name Weil is a, is a from from German uh, background. In this case, Yiddish. Uh, so I'll, I'll be trying to say V, but it's uh, I, 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 with my Dutch background, I'll probably be saying Weil often. Um, so we see here uh, the, the the two books. I haven't shown my own, the, the 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 cover of my own book. Um, I'm, I was trying to prevent that, but in this case it's important. Um, so we have grace and gravity on the right, and gravity and grace on on the left. So is there, is there a relationship? Well, of course there's a relationship. Um, and uh, the strange thing is, I I hardly mention Simone Weil uh, in, in in my own book. Uh, she ended up in a note. And that's because uh, if, you, uh, if I, I, I constructed that book in a very precise manner, and I couldn't really find a spot where I could like properly uh, uh, dedicate, like uh, the, the put the proper amount of 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 of, uh, of analysis and, and arguments in relationship to her work. Of course, it's very important. I have to say that the, the, the opposition of gravity and grace is much much older than uh, than her title. Um, by the way, it's not her title. It's a, she. It's a very strange story. She, um, um, Simone Weil was at that moment um, living with a, a French priest, and this is already uh, du during the Second World War. Uh, Gustave, Gustave Thibon, and uh, I'm not sure why, but she left all her notebooks uh, with him before she left with her family, uh, father, and mother, to. Uh, I think her brother as well, uh, to uh, to New York, uh, to to escape uh, the Nazis, and then later they returned again to London. Not not long late, not long after, maybe four or five months later. But they they left for New York, and uh, she said to Thibault, uh, "I'm leaving you all my notebooks, and uh, you can do with them. If I don't return, you can do with them with you with uh, whatever you want, uh, either for yourself or or pub pub publish them." So uh, the, the, that that was that was quite. I, I'm, I'm wondering why did she didn't take her own notes with her? She could have like uh, properly worked them out. But anyway, maybe she didn't want to work them out. It, 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 
both grace and gravity, uh, uh, and they're strongly related in this book, um, um, are treated. Uh, so that, that, that Gustave Tubon uh, uh, gave that book the title. Uh, it sounds not as uh, cool in, in French as in uh, English. There's not the, the alliteration. There's a uh, le, le pesanteur et la grâce. Um, uh, it's of course it's a very very classic. I've discussed this a few times. Uh, we know it from ancient Greece, uh, Charis and Semnos. Semnos means uh, august or serious. So and of course Shreer, serious relates to Shreer, and Shreer means heavy. It was already gratia and gravitas in in uh, in uh, Latin, and then later it became a, a grace and dignity in. in was it eighteenth century England with Henry Home, and then it became Anmut und Würde with uh, with Schiller, a late eighteenth century. So the, the opposition of grace and gravity is, is very very old, it's very ancient, um, and uh, it's not specifically Christian. It's not that uh, that's also an important thing to say. It's not specifically Christian, but it is. Uh, it <laughs> it is of course important for Christianity. So the, though it's never discussed in the Bible and literally as as uh, as gravity as gravitas, we'll we'll get to that. We we'll get to the writings of uh, of Paul, who talks about works uh, and grace and, and and works is ergon and ergon relates to structure to workings uh, and and I think in that case it's it's exactly the same meaning as uh, Simone Weil gives to it. Um, because uh, it, it's about the laws of nature. It's about the laws of nature, and for her, um, gravity is is not natural. It's it's universal. That's true, but it's it's supernatural, and uh, it's, in that sense, it's 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 quite different than. Uh, than uh, what we are speaking about, um, and she also speaks about it in the notion of a power, um, and and, and um, Paul does that too, um, but they they both speak about power in a strange way, and uh, that's also beautiful because uh, of course gravity is a force. Well, not not according to Einstein, by the way, and it's 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 it's, it's a, it's a its relationship to space-time, um, so it's not a force; it's a curvature. But uh, let's just discuss it as a force, as something we undergo and we suffer, um, what she calls affliction. And uh, it's uh, it, it, in our sense as being an absence of force, and uh, um, as a weakening. Um, uh, as we saw already in contraposto, it's both standing and falling, or it's a, it's a buckling of uh, or it's a buckling of limbs as well as a, as a straightening of limbs. So we get the serpentine and the cross already like connected in the notion of of the contraposto. Um, so, what do we have? Um, uh, it's grace and gravity. Uh, she is a Christian. She's, uh, she didn't start as a Christian. She she was converted, but not to Catholicism, though a lot of her arguments are are very close to Catholicism. And uh, there's a lot of interest, all very early on, in, in uh, by Catholics like Thomas Merton, for instance, in the in the work of uh, of Simone Weil, also T. S. Eliot. People, uh, just like really hardcore Catholics, uh, would be reading uh, would be reading Simone Weil, but it. Um, it's a, a lot of things that uh, are part of the, the Christian dogma or the Catholic dogma, like providence and the immortal soul and baptism. She didn't believe in that at all, and uh, she's very adamant about these things. So I don't think she should ever could be able uh, make her make herself part of the church. And, and for her, the notion of a church is is quite quite opposed to the notion of Christianity or be, becoming a Christian. So. Uh, she starts like with this this uh, a, a very radical argument, which is very close, I have to say, to to that of the grace machine, because it, it starts with absence. God can only be present in creation under the form of absence, which is uh, which is both a logical and a, and a shocking argument, uh, the, which places her um, in in what we call negative uh, uh, theology. Uh, 
uh, which is, is quite a strong part uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of Christian theology, also especially in the 20th century, because uh, of course, uh, since uh, Nietzsche declared God dead, uh, a, a, a lot of um, uh, theologists have, have tried to sort of g grapple with that idea of God being dead or absent or silent. That's not all. All these three are three are different, but then generally we we we, we categorize these as uh, as uh, what we call apophatic uh, theology, which means negative theology, right? So God acts from a position of uh, of absence. Now, suppose you're God, and uh, after seven days of creation. Um, You've created the world, and we created man, and uh, everything's perfect. You, of course, I don't want to make a joke out of it, but it's, of course, it's obvious that on the on the eighth day, so to speak, you find out you cannot show yourself, uh, you know, because if uh, if God would show Himself to its creation, we'd all end up as puppets, right? We'd all be like in, struck in awe day after day after day and it would be impossible to do anything and everything we would do would be the work of slaves, right? We be, could be constantly looking up if we do it right. So it's impossible. It's about impossible to, sh to show himself, uh, God, for God to show himself. Uh, very different than the Greek gods that, who would sort of show themselves constantly but in other forms right they would always metamorphosize and become a swan or a bull or whatever and constantly transform into figures of course the Greeks are obsessed with uh, with with pre presence and appearances which is why I, I love it so much but here God, God has to uh, be present in the form of absence, which is a, a, a paradox, obviously, um, but it doesn't mean he's just not there. Um, for uh, for Simone Weil, it, 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 it's, it's, it verges on the edge of atheism, and uh, she was actually quite positive about atheism. And um, um, what she said is that a a a atheism is a purification, um, and uh, um, because there's uh, there's no consolation, and uh, I, she had real problems with uh, with the idea of uh, of religion as as a form of consolation, because it would deny death, and uh, so for her, not only the absence of God is important, but also our own uh, finitude and uh, our own absence. Uh, sort of the, this double nakedness, right? She would speak about that there's only two m moments in our lives that we're truly naked and that's when we're born and when we die. That's probably true. Um, so she would say that atheism at least is, uh, is uh, uh, confronts us with this, uh, with this idea of, uh, of being apt absent ourselves and uh, that there is no that there's no consolation and there's also an, a notion in atheism that it's an enduring and enduring is an important term for her because it relates to waiting uh, attente uh, in french um, the, and, and the, the, that's the only way to uh, to relate to god so and we'll get to that because it, it, it has to do with her own void but uh, the, so th there is a notion of uh, of absence in in uh, in her theology, which is very close to uh, what we have been calling the gap, um, uh, especially as a gap as a, as a form of uh, what you could almost call positive n nihilism. Um, and nihilism is normally negative and dark. Um, I've tried to reverse that. I'm I'm trying to say that the gap is actually that where consciousness occurs and uh, and where the figures are born. So we have internal gaps and external gaps and these internal gaps and external gaps uh, need to like fit fit on top of each other. And uh, that's how Lionel Messi, for instance, makes a goal via a curve and how, how uh, a dolphin jumps uh, to breathe. 
And uh, so that there's this constant uh, uh, finding of gaps. And, and I guess in that sense, the, the theological structure of, of Christianity d does acknowledge the gap, and but on, on a sort of a scale of the whole universe. Um, it's not often discussed, uh, God is not often discussed as a gap. Of course, uh, with the deconstruction, it was almost unavoidable. So we got a lot of uh, theology after Nietzsche. I remember, just think of uh, Altheiser, Thomas Altheiser, the, the famous uh, theologist who would think through the, uh, the death of God. And, uh, and, and even the people like uh, John Caputo uh, would, 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 well, would not actually call God a gap, but uh, uh, making use of the gap. Um, um, so there's a lot of sort of relationships in, uh, in Christian theology between uh, God and, and, and the notion of a gap. Of course, we, we know the, the, the idea of, uh, of Kierkegaard, um, that, that faith is a leap. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful idea because it uh, has nothing to do with the notion of belief. I think that's also important to say that, that faith is very different than belief. Belief is really pseudoscience. It's really sort of thinking, okay, the gap is filled, right? There's God is sitting in the gap. And from that sort of a transcendent point of view, which is not transcendent at all, it's basically a, a hidden space, a sort of a, a, another extensive realm uh, where, where God is then placed and, uh, and, and, and rules over the universe. Uh, that's what belief is. It's sort of a, a, a stand-in for science. Uh, faith is something completely different. It deals with the gap. It's just al always understood as something that, that happens at the moment of conversion. So we take a leap, and then when we finally, sort of in the arms of the church, um, um, the leap is over. That's, that's normally how the metaphor is, is, is used, right? So we, we took a leap and now we're on, on stable ground. But that's not, that's not what faith is at all. It's, it's really living with the gap and uh, with the abyss, and uh, that which is very close to Oscar Wilde. And we discussed Oscar Wilde's co-fraternity of the faithless. So faith and faithless are actually quite quite interesting construct of Oscar Wilde that it, it has to do with the faith really much more as a notion of confidence or, or trust instead of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of belief. So that, that, it, it, in that sense, a religion and the Christian religion maybe specifically is a, is a, is a practice of leaping. I think all religions are practices. And, and that means that uh, we somehow have to uh, habituate and we have to uh, sort of seek specific actions and relationships and uh, how we deal with others and uh, how, we, how we find, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't almost say the good, but it, uh, at least uh, sort of uh, relate mm -hmm. What happens to us in sense of suffering and uh, bearing to uh, to how we behave and uh, how we carry ourselves and that so there's both these are terms from uh, from gravity uh, uh, suffer as a, as a form of bearing and carrying ourselves as a, as a form of behavior so f faith is really in that sense a, 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 a fidelity or a, or a form of uh, of confidence and and constant leaping so that how it deals with that with that gap and that and that absence. So that means that it's um, it's another form of uh, of infinity. Um, so normally our God as as infinite is is this notion of uh, of uh, of a sort of periphery of the universe that keeps on extending. So we have the infinite and it keeps on going and it keeps on going and. Uh, Court Leibniz talks about God as as infinite and Simone Weil as well, but it's it, it's that's almost like a parking of that void outside of the of the, of the of the laws of nature out of uh, out of the real, and I think what, what Simone Weil tries to do is sort of park that void or place that void actually not at the, at the periphery but at the center. 
So how, and that means a presence of absence. That means a presence of absence. It's like so if it, you have to confront yourself with that void. I'm, I'm trying to be as theological as I can here. So there's a, and, and uh, she calls that how to deal with that in the best way we can only do by what she calls a decreation. Decreation is, um, so we, we're, in a, in a, we are uh, living in a, in a world of gravity and the laws of nature, and these laws of nature are part of creation. And our cells and our free wills and everything are part of of of, uh, of the created. But God has distanced Himself from the created, and He needs to d distance Himself because, uh, or else again, uh, He would be He He would be a, a Present in a, in, a, in a sense of present presence, uh, and uh, of course there's no way to live with that. So that's uh, the, the, he needs to retreat and withdraw, and uh, which is a really fantastic idea because and I think Simone Weil actually says that God pu pulled up a curtain, pulled up a curtain uh, of space, matter, and time, and uh, so he, there's a retreating. There's a retreating. And the only way for us to 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 deal with that void um, is to access the void or accept the void ourselves, and uh, and that can only and I think that's what you got directly from Buddhism, but it's important in Christianity as well because uh, I think uh, Paul already called it kenosis, and we we see that, and that kenosis means an emptying out, an emptying out, and we see that term very often in uh, in relationship to saints and martyrs um that this this going through the the dark night of the soul as saint john of the cross calls it and that this dark night uh, being a sort of undoing an undoing of yourself so that that's uh, i think that's that's the main idea of the creation it's it's an undoing um Oh, so why is that important? Because uh, uh, it acknowledges that we have a self, but we then have to undo that self, or we have a free will, but then we have to lose that free will to actually find grace. Right? So it's a complex construct. It's like the creation and then the withdrawal of God in that creation. Then we acknowledging that void and then accessing that void through decreation by an undoing of the self and uh, of course it's it's what's most important is uh, how you how you do that undoing so it, it is a notion of practice i think that's very important in her it's not just going to church uh, not at all i'm not sure that she actually went ever went to church simone will but there is this this undoing and uh, th there's many examples uh, in the life of uh, simone will and um, undoing herself, like working in the Renault factory, being totally unsuited for for that work, obviously, uh, as an intellectual with two left hands, right? <laughs> that would be a disaster. You can imagine working in a, in a car factory, you have very specific movements. Um, so that didn't work for her, and then working uh, very, very hard on, on, uh, on the land with uh, Gustave Thibault. And then writing at night, so there's a there's a this eclipsing of the ego is very important to her, and uh, in that hand there was uh, involved all kinds of uh, of uh, deprivations, um, um, like uh, for instance not using sugar because the the soldiers at, at the front. Um, the soldiers uh, fighting the Nazis at the front also didn't have sugar. Uh, so Simone Weil um, uses all kinds of certain kinds of techniques of uh, of of undoing herself, and uh, well, it has to be said that the undoing of herself became very literal uh, because she died very young at uh, do, uh, do, I think nineteen forty three during the Second World War. And uh, and it was actually uh, uh, described by the by the f by the physicians as as a suicide. So, as a, uh, 
we would nowadays call it anorexic. I think that's a, it would be ridiculous to make a pathology out of it. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, saints are described as anorexic, um, but for them, it's the it's the their vacancy, their becoming vacant is is the way to 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 access the vacancy at the at the cross, right? That's that's the words of uh, of. Uh, I think Thomas Akempis, I'm not sure, in the description of um, of uh, Litwin of Schiedam, who we discussed uh, uh, at the point when we when we spoke about saints and uh, how how saints uh, used pain and, and affliction um, to access that vacant spot at the cross. So uh, for for her, uh, for Simone Weil, uh, there's this uh, she, there's this construct. So we get the vertical of gravity, we get the vertical of gravity, and there's this void, and you can only access that void by by a lightening, by by an upward movement. Um, um, which which um, which she describes as a, as a waiting um, and now it's in French it's more beautiful than in English because uh, waiting is attente uh, and attente relates to attention uh, so for her for her this this accessing of the void and this becoming selfless means um, a, a turning towards attention. And attention is really in her mind not an attention for objects, but actually a sort of, uh, I think she called it a passive activity. A passive activity. Uh, that's, a, that's a term we even use for sports, uh, finding passivity in action, and finding action in, in passivity. Um, so mm -hmm. for her, that, uh, that, that notion of uh, of attention became really central and uh, oh, oh, why is that because uh, i think she discusses it here so if we god made it so that his grace when it penetrates to someone's very center and, and illuminates their whole being permits that person to walk on water without violating the laws of nature now how that works we will get to that later but when someone turns away from god they simply give themselves over to gravity then they believe they will and choose but they're only a thing a falling stone so for her will and, cho and choice that means free will uh, is still extremely uh, determined right this is a form of determinism so you become part of the laws of nature you become a thing a falling stone and um, if we look at this closely with a truly attentive gaze, here we come, we see that wherever the virtue of supernatural light is absent, everything obeys mechanical laws as blind and precise in the laws of falling bodies. So that's her idea of gravity, as she calls this idea of gravity a, a affliction. Um, uh, in French, malheur. Malheur, it's a beautiful word because it means a bad hour. Um, this is a horrible translation. Um, but it does relate to that idea of practice. Um, so it's something you do um, uh, and you have to practice it. So we, we get to this idea of uh, how habit, and this is of course another habit than the habits we undergo uh, in our daily lives, but to actually have a habit of attention and train yourself to habituate, uh, uh, habituate yourself to, to being attentive and of course it being attentive especially to others. Now um, it's already in the first pages you know this is like what is it page one and page three of, uh, of the Grace and Gravity and don't forget these are notes right so it's not it's not a, a systematic approach. It's not. These are not paragraphs, so you cannot really properly put them together. It's a, and this is all done by uh, Gustave Thibon. It wasn't uh, these. The, the headings are not uh, Simone Weil. Uh, so we we get like a, a, a lot of different uh, descriptions, and we can't really know um, how precise they are. And uh, of course, that's a little criticism in the direction of Gustave Thibon. Um, I, I, I don't have access to the, the actual uh, notebooks of, uh, of uh, Simone Weil, 
but it, it would be very difficult to to see where she's trying things out and and uh, and, and, and and when she's uh, much more certain so it's not a properly worked out book in that sense so we have to be very careful um, but it seems very clear that, uh, you know, gra grace is the only exception. So all the natural movements on the soil are controlled by laws and logos analogous to those of physical gravity. So the word gravity stands for all natural laws. And grace is the only exception. And grace means light. So for a physicist, this is already quite a statement because, of course, light for them falls under this uh, whole structure of, uh, of the physical laws. Um, well, uh, don't forget what we see. Uh, we have to discuss this for uh, for a moment, uh, and that's not just colors, but it's light, uh, light in all kinds of ways. But uh, don't forget that um, um, if um, when a, when a physicist uh, explains light. Mm, it's electromagnetic waves um, from photons that hit your eye and then uh, the, the, the nerve structure from your eye all the way to the visual part of your brain which is almost like uh, molecules that keep on hammering on each other uh, you know from from one uh, that's completely causal mechanism which is very obviously very close to what Simone Well calls laws by an analogous to the physical laws of gravity. And then there's this, what we see, and then suddenly we see red and green and orange, and then we smell and we taste salt. And no, no physicist can explain what happens there. So don't ever let, tell, let, let a physicist tell you that he can or she can explain uh, what red is or blue or orange or what the taste of salt is because all that, though, those causal mechanisms of, uh, of molecules and ions and photons cannot say anything about uh, what we experience uh, because it's we're suddenly in the realm of consciousness. So there's no... Basically, for physicists, the whole world is dark, right? There's nothing. There's only the hitting of black things and other black things and, and tasteless molecules and other tasteless molecules. And what we make of it uh, is in our brain. That's what they would say. But <laughs> obviously, that's not an explanation. So, uh, Simone Well's right, you know, and there's light and gravity. It's just very frustrating. So, it, it means... Um, it, it, it means she introduces it as a dialectic. Now, she has a problem with that dialectic, but that's, is, it only becomes clear if, if you read her notes very, very clearly and uh, very precisely. So, um, see, for instance, here, um, on the third page, uh, to come down by a movement in which gravity plays no part. How is that possible? Okay. Gravity makes things come down. Wings make them rise. What wings raise to the second power can make things come down without weight? Okay, so she's asking herself, herself like, okay, gravity makes things come down. So that's the world of creation, of, uh, of affliction, of malheur. Um, of uh, of living under the laws of, of, of gravity and then we lighten ourselves um, by decreation and wings make us rise so with wings raised and then it comes down without weight so that's not a simple opposition of gra of light and gravity it's not just like okay we have gravity of weight and then light and don't let of course light means both without weight and uh, and the visual realm right so that's upward movement in the in the sort of the, the dialectic uh, direction of decreation of decreation and then it comes down again but without weight so wait a minute creation is composed of the descending movement of gravity so that's clear the ascending movement of grace so that's supernatural 
and the descending movement of the second degree of grace. Now there we get, so it's not dialectic at all. There's a loop, there's a loop, and uh, so that, and, and that's a, a sort of friction in, 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 uh, in the book, because you have to be totally aware of that, that grace has a double meaning, and that's, uh, I've been trying to do the same, obviously, to explain that grace is not anti-gravity, but it actually deals with gravity, or it involves both anti-gravity and gravity. That's the Pont Contraposto figure. Uh, Simon Weil does not use the notion of figures or posture or manner or ways of, or any of these uh, of these um, figures. I've been trying to introduce. Um, that's not so important, but she does. She does relate grace back to gravity. So what we have is a creation, decreation, and recreation as sort of my notes in the margins. So there's a there's a uh, there's a, 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 a double uh, a double figure of of, of grace. Now let's see how how that works. Um, uh, later, oh, that's already page. What is page eleven? Um, I made this diagram. So there we get the gravity. Here we get the void. So we're accessing the void. It gives us an upward movement. Don't think that's correct, but it's. She often discusses God as, as, as in a very Platonic way, as a source of goodness and uh, and uh, and and radiance and this, like a very Platonic notion of the sun. Um, of course, I've been using radiance as well, <coughs> um, not in the same way, not as a sort of. Uh, uh, um, um, elevated uh, sublime uh, uh, structure but what's really interesting is this moving back and uh, that, that that reminds me so of uh, of Kleist um, when he describes the puppet um, and the puppeteer now that's dangerous to use these terms in the, in, in relationship to uh, Christianity um, but um, there, there was this uh, fantastic concave mirror because it's not a puppet puppeteer. The puppet puppeteer was a chiastic structure of a single dancer. It was not a puppeteer, but he was his own puppeteer. So he was finding uh, his own lightness um, up there and, uh, and uh, he was pulling his own thread, so to speak, um, by this, this con what he called a concave mirror. A concave mirror, and, and that was the same type of loop. The concave mirror would be, be here, right? So that's a, it's it's a very similar construction of, of grace, um, and 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 a, a very very uh, courageous and uh, and uh, powerful. So there, there must be a a a, a, a structure for this. Um, I think she actually d describes this uh, this 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 accessing of the void um, as a, um, the, to accept the void as a as a, as a as a form of uh, opening up. I think that's that would be a, maybe the best way of of describing this this uh, this stage of attention as an opening up. She I think she actually describes it as a form of gen generosity. It's not just a showing of the generosity, but itself the opening up is a, a, this, this sort of passive activity as a as a as a as a as a receiving as an opening up to receive, and I think that's a, that in, in, from the point of view of the of the of the grace machine and the, and the gift cycle, this is a, a, a very correct. Uh, a very correct notion of uh, accepting and accessing the void, because uh, of course in our own life it's uh, is uh, this this accepting the void becomes very dramatic as it as it does with saints. She's often been called a saint. T. S. Eliot calls her a saint, um, the saint of the outcasts. Um, that might all be true, but. By that notion of uh, of attention, I'm thinking of My Iris Murdoch as well. I'm not sure if you're, you're all familiar with the works of Iris Murdoch. She was a philosopher as well as a, as a, as a, 
as a novelist and uh, uh, and she she was a platonist like uh, Simone Will and um, and uh, she worked a lot with this notion of attention and um, um, she actually describes it a few times um, I have the sovereignty of the good uh, here uh, she she wrote a lot about the good a very platonic notion I'm not saying that the gift structure doesn't hasn't have anything to do with the good but it's not it's I'm not sure if it's a moral structure of the good it's much more an ethics of the good and it's an understanding of the good within the in the in the gift structure that means it's it's about beneficence and uh, to be beneficial or beneficent and, um, and as a, the notion of a gift so it's about it's not so much about doing good it's much more about doing well and of course doing well is is very ambiguous because we want to do well for ourselves as want to do well for others so that uh, immediately but uh, all, all our arguments are uh, looping and, uh, and circular so why not this one anyway we're leaving uh, Simone Will um, and we're going to uh, uh, I'm going to like only show a few of uh, of, uh, of of the statements of uh, Paul I'd like to say Saint Paul but I'm not Catholic but uh, it's just fantastic to call somebody a saint so I'm saying, going to say Saint Paul um, is really the most interesting figure uh, around the period of Christ of course he's older um, but uh, th there's a few things that we have to say about Paul um, so we have the Old Testament New Testament half of the New Testament are writings the epistles of Paul and he called himself uh, he's, he's quite different than the other apostles he calls himself the 13th apostle the other apostle and uh, and they didn't agree with that at all um, and um, and it, and it has to be really understood as um, he's, I, I call him the first theologist and uh, he's really the, the major pillar of, uh, of Christianity a very very interesting figure um, I don't think even Christianity would exist without Paul um, why because the other apostles are much more caught in the in the in the structure of Judaism and uh, they saw Christ as a, as a figure in Judaism and uh, of course the word Christianity did not exist at that time there was no Bible re to refer to there was just the Torah and uh, well, mainly as a part of the Old Testament and um, uh, Paul wanted to open it up to the Gentiles and uh, which are the non-Jews and uh, and they didn't always like that and he went pretty far in that that's one thing we have to say and the other thing we have to say is that Paul introduced the word charis in uh, Christianity so anybody that speaks about grace um, has to understand in, in, a, in a Christian context has to understand that grace is not given at all in, in Christianity it did exist in, uh, in Judaism but in, in a very different way uh, it was called gen, gen uh, in, in Hebrew and it's much more a notion of favor um, now favor is related to the gift cycle but it's not as horizontal it's quite vertical it's quite like um, it's really this Old Testamentian idea of of God throwing a sort of super abundance over us and it has to do with all kinds of uh, very transcendent notions of, uh, of, of God in the sky and uh, with lightning and you know with all these ideas of uh, epiphanies and visions and um, and the apocalypse and uh, just quite a quite a something else than uh, what, where Paul came from came Paul came from Tarsus which is southern uh, the southwest of uh, Turkey where at that time they spoke uh, Greek because uh, we, we are uh, we are sort of in the late Hellenic period and um, 
and of course it's already Rome in uh, in um, in Israel. So the Roman Empire is like already expanded to, to the to the east, but over a Hellenic structure. So we have to understand that um, the word charis, as it was used by Pindar and Homer in the city eighth century BC. Uh, is uh, slowly transforms to a sort of social idea of uh, of, uh, of the gift in Aristotle, which is the fourth fifth century BC, uh, and then it becomes uh, Hellenism and Stoicism. So we got a lot of uh, Stoic philosophers like Chrysippus and Poseidonius and uh, Cleanthes uh, discussing. Uh, gift structure but most of these books are lost and but they're referred to by uh, for instance uh, Diogenes uh, Laertius and uh, Seneca which is of course a Roman Stoic so there is a there is a, a whole history of uh, of Charis um, that ends up in Stoicism and uh, that late Hellenic uh, Greek uh, was the language that Paul spoke in, uh, in the south of Turkey. So the word charis was, uh, was a very, very much part of his uh, vocabulary and the vocabulary of his culture. And, and all the epistles that he writes, the letters to the Romans and the Corinthians and all his travels, uh, uses this word and introduces it to the core of Christianity. And... Uh, that changes things completely. It changes things completely because um, in the Old Testament, God is this uh, this this vertical being, uh, the, and um, and you have to see here, for instance. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Now it is quoted very very often, Romans eleven six. Uh, but this based on works is actually ergon. So that it means work in the sense of uh, power and, and energy. And the word energy comes from ergon. And it is in the, this is uh, that word of gravity. And what he's doing here is uh, criticizing uh, Judaism. Because works for, uh, for uh, Paul means uh, uh, the obedience to the commandments now in a judaic structure um, um, the, the the commandments are not the ten commandments we know they're actually 613 and uh, they're sort of a structure of do's and don'ts right so it's not just a structure that you should not do this or you should not do that but it's actually a structure also of that you should do this I think there's actually 385 negative commandments of what you should not do, and there's 248 commandments of what you should do. I'm not going through them, but that's the, that's the notion of Judaism. And the idea is that when you obey those commandments, you do good. That's that's the idea. That's the idea. So. And Paul found himself in a, in a Judaic world where people would boast about what he called, and you find that word all the time in, uh, in, in Paul's writings, um, where people would boast about their, uh, their, their obedience, because uh, that would mean that salvation, you could buy off, you could buy off salvation, basically. It, it's a monetary structure. It's a... It's an economy. When you do this, you get that. So you, you actually do good according to the, the 613 commandments and then you get, you'll be saved. And that means immortality. And, uh, and um, Paul was, was vehemently about, uh, uh, against this, this idea of, of works. So the Old Testament is actually called the book of, of works or the law uh, with the law of works and uh, the New Testament, the, 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 the law of grace or you can call it a law, but 
as almost as an opposition. So this is the, the, the idea of the chiastic structure of grace and gravity is uh, deeply embedded in uh, the Bible itself. Um, because uh, he is very clear that grace would no longer be grace if it would be based on works, right? So there we have the words charitos, chariti, uh, charis, charis, and ergon, right? So he's uh, he uh, and, uh, and the other apostles were quite nervous about this, but he is um, he is basically I think what he's doing is is this he is. He is transforming the, the pure verticality of transcendence and transcendence. Now, let's not forget that Kant that Kant actually compares the the, um, the experience of the sublime to uh, to the Hebrew God uh, 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 being absent because he cannot show himself to Moses. So Moses on the mountain, mountain is always a, a figure of the sublime cannot look, see God uh, cannot see the face of God because he would he would perish and that's so that's always a notion of terror and fear and awe what we call in aesthetics awe so awe doesn't mean beautiful it actually means terrifying and um, and Paul tries to like make that more horizontal but on the other hand He's taking the idea of uh, of the Stoic idea of uh, of Charis, which has become totally horizontal and a sort of model of a so sociable exchange uh, between people in a community uh, without any notion of transcendence. So he's like making the vertical model of Judaism more horizontal, and the, and, and the horizontal model, the social model of Charis and gift structure. Um, of of Hellenism and Stoicism, he's making that more transcendent. So he's, I think he's he's um, that's a, a, a major invention and uh, obviously very powerful because we've been living with it for two thousand years. And now we get this very very famous uh, sentence um, from two Corinthians twelve. Um, but he said to me that God who speaks to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now this, uh, this, this would be a, a something that is uh, um, that would relate very much to Simon Weil, Simon Weil, because it's uh, this is about a, a, a weakness. So that there's uh, and that that has been. Uh, very much part of our argument of uh, of uh, of uh, of grace as well. It's not uh, grace is not a form of strength, nor is it a form of, of pure weakness. But it's bringing weakness in, into strength. Contraposto is, is a partial buckling and partial falling in 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 that of standing. So that uh, the the idea of weakness very central. Um, it is called a power though, a dynamis. Um, dynamis, an uh, Aristotelian term for uh, for power, or also uh, ergon. It's not, not really the same as ergon, but it is a, a form of influence through uh, through transformation. What what is normally called entelechy, right? The dynamis is really that what structures the entelechy of bec of becoming a, a, a final th a thing. Uh, which, which we're not going into now, but uh, uh, what I'd really like to uh, point out is that a, a grace is sufficient. Archai. Archai um, um, is, uh, is, uh, it becomes a, a word that is, uh, takes place in, uh, in Christian theology for the next 2,000 years. Um, but this is the core of it, or this is the origin of that use of the word, because um, very quickly in Christianity, uh, if if I would like follow the whole structure going like from the from how is it Charis uh, in the use of uh, of um, of of Chrysippus and then to Seneca and then how it's being picked up by uh, Christian Platonists like Plotinus. Um, uh, pseudo Dionysius, um, all the sort of patristic figures of the the, the early, f f the 
was it the early few centuries, like uh, it was Pseudo Dionysius is the uh, fifth century. Um, there we get Augustine. For Augustine, it's already grace is already a, quite an overpowering. Uh, he actually talks about predestination. So, for him, grace is um, is really a power. That means that God has uh, has uh, the power of providence and can actually foresee all the effects of his actions. And uh, that would that would make uh, the the fate of uh, of humans um, uh, predetermined, and that notion of predeterminism has a very powerful influence on uh, on Christian theology, and that becomes uh, efficacious uh, grace. So at a certain point, uh, we so we we fast forward now to the sixteenth century and. Uh, Dutch theologists like Janssen, Jensen, and Arminius play a very important role in this uh, in this idea, and um, um, it's uh, it's uh, an idea that is uh, sort of splits Christianity because, um, of course, uh, you you'll see a lot of uh, defense of uh, advocacy of efficacious grace. In Reformed Church, while you will see a lot of uh, defense of uh, of sufficient grace in, on the Catholic side, especially the Jesuits, um, and it means that um, that that this idea of efficient and sufficient there's a, there's a, an important difference and. Um, um, the efficient or the efficacious um, does relate to Augustine's notion of predestination and foreseeing God as sort of uh, seeing his creation as, as completely transparent, not just in space but also in time. It's also presented as a as a critique on uh, on on uh, sufficient grace because sufficient grace was basically the core of uh, of uh, christian theology um especially since uh, thomas aquinas um who was an advocate of uh, of sufficient grace um but uh, there's a, there's an important uh, argument in uh, in efficacy um, um and, and that is if 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 grace works if it is sufficient, and the word sufficient uh, comes from sub and uh, facere, and uh, that that uh, that means actually satisfactory. It's um, uh, factory facere is the same, so to do or to make. But sub is not just a, 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 an um, uh, an underneath. It's also it, it actually means set is uh, enough. So uh, when it is enough, it's actually efficient. It works, um, but now if you read Paul, if you read Paul, it would mean that uh, 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 we have to receive grace because we can only uh, walk by grace and not by sight, right? As he says, right? So uh, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's actually the, the proper quote, but it is a form of grace. Um, against the notion of ergo and uh, of course uh, efficacious uh, 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 relates to efficient cause uh, Aristotle's efficient cause <clears throat> and that would make grace a form of ergo uh, an ergo coming from God and uh, of course that that won't work, right? So that uh, they're, they're probably right in their criticism of uh, of uh, of sufficient sufficiency of grace. But to actually counter that with uh, with efficiency and efficacy, um, that would never work because it would transform grace into into uh, work. It cannot be that great that God works and 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 we can only respond to that working by uh, by by literal following because then we lose free will again and we become puppets it's not a form of puppeteering so there's grace going in two directions 
God has to act as indirectly. I'm, 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 I'm a bit embarrassed here, but I have to do like my only mini uh, theology here. But God, God has to uh, operate operate through grace as as well as we have to operate through grace. So if he acts through the void, we have to act through the void. So as if we are attentive, he has to be attentive just using Simone Weil so there, there, there must be an absolute mimesis here an, an absolute exchange there's no position of power we, we will get to this uh, what, what transcendence actually means and what that sort of a sensation or that accessing of verticality means in the sense of transcendence but it's not a space to act from it's not there's not a second space right there's a, transcendence does not mean there's a second space where you can occupy and you have a new form of uh, extensivity um, and that's uh, heaven is not a place <laughs> so transcendence is is not is not the infinite is not a place to act from of to have workings from the workings come directly from the void from God's non-existence. I think this is, uh, the, Mea Su actually calls it inexistence. Um, uh, I know Caputo talks about the gap, but he talks about insistence. Um, so God doesn't exist, but he insists. But that's, uh, that's, uh, that's imminence, right? That's God hiding in nature. That's pure Spinoza. So insistence means pushing. It's a form of drive. This is a terminology we know from uh, imminence and uh, romanticism. There's real transcendence. I, uh, there's, I'm totally convinced that in the in the grace machine, there's a, the structure. It's structured through transcendence, and this uh, this transcendence is the gap, is the void, um, and that's actually quite central to the to idea. But that it it works is not. A form of ergon is not a form of ergon so we have to be very careful with the saying that there's a there, there is an actual power now i know saint paul actually uses that word ergon but it it goes directly against this uh, the concept of grace if you want to have a, a relationship of of a gift and ge generosity there's no way you can have grace going in one direction and ergon in the other so if we are not allowed according to the new testament and the epistles of paul if we are not allowed to to do ergon to right to act according to laws uh, then the same goes for god obviously or else there would be god would be natural or the supernatural would just be a second nature right so that 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 doesn't work uh, so there's a there's another this is a notion of sufficient grace and we're going to follow this uh, this uh, word sufficient, but it it doesn't mean that there is a, a way of degreeing uh, of of weighing this uh, this uh, a way of weighing uh, um, the, the amount of power. Uh, this uh, is of course quite clear that if there's a God and He's infinite, you would never be able to uh, give all His power to uh, to small entities like uh, human beings. And uh, Paul actually has a fantastic idea, uh, which is uh, which you could you don't find in the Old Testament. Um, he talks about uh, uh, um, the the heart. Uh, sometimes he calls it the spirit, but he very often calls it the heart. So humans have a heart. That's our soft spot. That's where where our weakness is seated. That's our own void, and. Um, this heart needs to be filled and uh, so there's a measure there's a measure and and, and it's a quite a beautiful idea because now we we actually if, if we place that in the in our idea of the gift uh, of, the, of the grace machine uh, this external gap is then god and the internal gap is this this mini gap is uh, is that of the of the heart and uh, that heart is of course in all things and on all molecules and all all it's because there's the consciousness but and there's this internal gap and the external gap and that's of course the structure of the grace, mach the grace machine but he actually calls it the heart which is a, a, a beautiful idea 
and to actually see if you can um, measure that that external gap, which is called, he wouldn't call it a gap, but he would call about, he would speak about kenosis, about emptiness, and how to actually measure that with the, with the internal gap of the heart. So that's that's important. Of course, the the, the other argument of sufficient grace is that it uh, it it leaves uh, humans open to free will, um, because if there's only a, a efficacious grace, uh, we would be puppets. So for the, the the Jesuit theologists, it was clear that uh, there needs to be a, a free will, because or else there wouldn't be a. a and the difference between damnation and salvation. So there wouldn't be the choice of uh, of belief and faith, uh, as well as uh, the, the the choice to, between belief and, and non-belief, right? Which is damnation and salvation. So there needs to be free will. There needs to be able to. There we need to be able to choose. So God needs to be restrained in his uh, in his uh, giving grace, and he can only give grace to those who want to receive it. I think that Simon Will is very close to that idea. Uh, it's just that, that grace itself is not a matter of free will. Obviously, you cannot will grace. Right? That's uh, that's impossible. Because then, will uh, grace would again be uh, be uh, part of uh, of the natural law. So there's there's uh, I think it's the structure goes like this that we we need free will to actually lose free will and like we need a self and to then lose that self and become selfless and then open up. So that that void always needs to be created and it needs to be created in something in something. So there's this this idea of uh, of uh, of how, and of course that's the big question of how this free will transforms into something that allows for that for that grace to happen, and uh, that, that that of course in uh, in 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 the therapy I'd almost call it of uh, of Simone Weil that is uh, the, the, this idea this training of uh, of attention. This, this constant waiting. So it's not just a form of doing good. Um, it's not a form of doing good. It's not for like free will being um, replaced by by following the, the 613 commandments and and then being uh, uh, saved. Now I'm going to show uh, two figures um, um, because these two very, very, very famous uh, mathematicians and philosophers are uh, quite exactly related to the, the notion of efficacious grace and, uh, and sufficient grace. And uh, we'll be discussing, and on the left we have Blaise Pascal, and on the right uh, Gottfried uh, Wilhelm uh, Leibniz. Um, um, the, the, they're both extremely interesting um, in in this whole framework. Of course, they're not just uh, interesting by themselves. Of course, they are, but uh, um, so that they fit, they fit um, um, within this framework of uh, of efficient and sufficient grace. Um, but both are also uh, very famous in their uh, mathematical approach to. Uh, to uh, probability, and here we get to the idea of chance. Uh, of course, we're still talking about falling. Right? Chance means falling, and uh, and uh, Pascal is often uh, titled the founder of probability, and uh, and Leibniz, a philosopher of uh, of uh, of probability. I have a book here about Ian Hacking and the emergence of probability and, and he discusses both quite extensively in their backgrounds not not within the framework of grace though but in the framework of, uh, of probability and uh, um, how that how that changes from being an opinion afterwards a posteriori right where you say oh that was probable to something that can, is actually works a priori beforehand, right? So, what is the probability of something that that still needs to happen, right? So that's of course how we use chance, and that's of course at that point that was before them, 
there was just a, a complete sense of uh, of uncertainty and uh, with probability that that idea of, of chance let's, let's not forget that uh, for instance aristotle i think aristotle used at least five different words for for chance as op opposed to um, necessity um, and, and necessity anonke and then you have uh, fate which is a, a form of chance, something, something that befalls, right? Chance is something that befalls upon you. So that's within the vertical structure. Uh, get tiche, tiche, uh, form of fate. And then we got um, symbebekos, which is a coincidence. And then we got accident, which is um, symptomata. Uh, but these are like in, in Greek philosophy, these are used in different ways, and of course, in, by, uh, in Aristotle's case, much more precisely. Um, and that later goes to uh, to uh, um, Epicureanism and uh, the, how to accept fate, um, and uh, later Stoicism. Um, but with uh, with these two figures, it, it, this this specific type of accident or coincidence becomes something that is calculable. There's a reckoning, and um, the fact that it's rec that it can be reckoned gives a a, 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 a very powerful structure to uh, to uncertainty, and and becomes at that point a form of uh, probability. Uh, which is a word they don't use at that point. It's only a, a, a word that's been uh, used uh, uh, later. Now, probability is important because it's about things happening. And uh, things happening uh, relate to, directly to the gift structure, to the grace machine, because it, it, it sees things as an event. Um, and, uh, of course, things happen. Right, so it's it's a notion of things that are happening, uh, even objects are happening, um, but that becomes sort of central in in our dear. So uh, it, it's uh, this this structure of falling becomes um, has now two directions. One is something that befalls upon us, which can be necessity as well as chance. So there is a there's a sort of a broader range of things that that we bear, so to speak, from a religious point of view. So there's there's this range of probability that of things that fall upon us. Then uh, things that we do can be either, as in the eyes of Simone Weil, uh, be following totally predetermined structure of uh, of gravity. Right, so that would be again a sort of necessity a posteriori. Right, so we have a, a necessity a priori and a, and, a, and, a, and a necessity a posteriori. But that also has a range, and that range can be is the range of free will. So we, we get something that 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 befalls upon us, and something that well, I would almost say falls out of us, uh, or uh, that we make happen. Right, so we're in a structure of things occurring, of, uh, of things that happen to us, that fall upon us, um, and things that we make happen, either determined or uh, less determined in the sense of, of, of free will. But we're in a realm of, of, of things happening. And of course, uh, the whole idea of, of, of good and, and better and best and uh, doing well uh, are all related to uh, to this how how we how we uh, are stabilized in time and how how we undergo things happening and how we make things happen. So let's look at what what they actually say. Um, I'm not going to do this too extensively on the side of uh, of Pascal. Um, but he's basically saying this, the thing I already said before, if, if it is sufficient grace, then it's actually efficient. That's as simple as it is. So it's a criticism 
it's not it's not a very positive uh, the, he's a jansenist the, and the jansenist or um, strangely of course jansen is uh, jansen is uh, is dutch but at that time uh, the, the, the 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 strongest following of uh, of of jansen jansen is is in is france and especially in the monastery of port royal um, where uh, where Pascal was uh, very strongly related to, he had uh, a few friends there. Uh, one of them, Arnaud, Arnaud also um, uh, uh, um, corresponded with Leibniz. So there's a, there this is a very intricate uh, 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 philosophical as well as theological uh, uh, exchange of of uh, of ideas. But it's uh, Pascal's very clear about uh, about about the idea of, of grace being efficient. And with Leibniz it's different. It said, and I'm showing this not so much for the, the part in red, but much more for the, because you're saying, well, it doesn't really work what the Jansenists are saying and the Molinists, uh, they're basically all advocates of, the, of, of, of efficacious grace. And I'm showing it much more for a quote of himself. This is actually a text from someone else. This is, this is a, the, the yellow one is actually a quote from Leibniz. This grace of God, whether ordinary or extraordinary, it's already beautiful, has its degrees and measures, needs to be measured in itself it is always efficacious in producing a definite proportional effect and furthermore it is always sufficient not only to protect us from sin but even to accomplish salvation so a form of measure now this is typical Leibniz so it's a, this we're in a world of uh, gradual variation of, uh, of of measure and weighing and of continuity right so God would always like measure uh, the amount of grace that needs to be administered, so to speak, um, to to the, to the creature that uh, that uh, would then still have enough free will to resist, but would be measured upon in a way that it would like o be able to overpower. Uh, this is very subtle, obviously, because it's philosophically it's very difficult, but it would be able to. Uh, to be able to be resisted, so we, we, as well as being received, so it, can, it cannot be a power that overpowers. That's as simple as it is. So it cannot be overpowering, but it has to be presented from absence. So it has to be presented, and it has to be presented in a way that it's just enough sufficient for that creature, for 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 us, in, in case of Leibniz, for us humans. To receive, so it is a it's a gift, it's a gift, and um, I think that's quite important. It does in both cases uh, relate to the notion of probability. Now we, I'm just I'm going to discuss like Pascal like very shortly. Um, uh, he he has a very uh, there's at a certain point in, in the 1650s there's this question of uh, if you are during a game. You're either playing cards or flipping coins or whatever type of chance game. It needs to be a chance game. Uh, um, uh, and you interrupt. You interrupt that game by some external uh, uh, conditions, through some external conditions. How do you then divide up uh, the pot? How do you divide up the money? That's on the table because you you cannot play on, right? You cannot play on later, so you have to. The, the game is interrupted, and there's not an equal uh, score at that moment. There's not an equal score at that moment. How do you then divide up the money according to that uh, uh, ratio? That uh, that's that score at that point. So the example is. And this is a, this is a set of letters, and Pascal is quite unclear about uh, this, and he's uh, corresponding with Fer Fermat, um, the, the as famous, uh, uh, maybe even more famous uh, mathematician. 
and Fermat has a has a brilliant idea, and uh, and this is about a, a, a game of uh, of uh, tossing coins, and there's two players, and one goes for heads, and the other goes for tails, right? And and we're in the third round, and uh, the play the first player has two heads, and uh, the the other player has one tail, so it's two to one, and the game's interrupted. How do you now divide up? And we still have two rounds to go, but we, we're basically we have to stop for some reason. Right? It's not important. We have to stop. And how do you divide up the money at that point? So you would think like, oh, it's two to one. That would make it. Let's divide it up in three. And that, so the one gets two thirds, and the other one third. Well, that's obviously wrong. Pascal knows this, but he has a very complicated set of arguments of how to divide it up, and it's not really correct. And, uh, and Fermat's much clearer. He said, oh, okay, what could be the next? What could be the outcomes? And this is really important. He's like, okay, it could be two heads, right? Around four and five could be two heads. So first player wins, because yeah, there will be more heads than tails. Uh, could be heads and tail. Or tail and heads, right? And uh, and again, the, the first player would win because uh, or, or, or even with one head, it would be uh, at the end three to two. So the, 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 he would all, also win. It's only when fourth and fifth round are both tail that the second player would win, right? So from four outcomes, from four outcomes. We actually have uh, 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 um, first player winning three of them, and the second player, the other player, would win only one out of the four. So we get three to four, right? So it's seventy-five percent. So player f player player one, right? The first player gets seventy-five percent of the money, and the other twenty-five percent. And this is exactly correct. And in the same year, in the same year, um, Pascal invents this, reinvents this triangle. Now, well, I'm showing this in the Chinese version because the Chinese version is much older. I think there's even an older version in uh, in, in Indian uh, culture and in Persian culture as well. But it's called Pascal's triangle now. Um, uh, but here you can actually see it in a, in a triangular structure of, uh, in, of the, uh, the Chinese version, I think, which is uh, uh, from the 1300s. So we got one and then one and one. And if we now add up that one, we get one and one and one makes two. Here becomes one and two becomes three. One and two becomes three. One stays there. One and three becomes four. Uh, three and three becomes six. This this uh, the sign of six. Uh, three and one become four. So we got what do we have? One 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 two one one three three one one four six four one and we can go all the way down. This is what we call the binomial tree, uh, which of course we 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 also use not just in all kinds of uh, mathematical problems, but also in probability. Right? If you if you would have uh, if you you would toss three coins, for instance, you would have um, three times heads. You would have. Uh, let me see, you would have three double heads and tail, right? H T H, H H T, T H H, right? You would have the, another three for um, heads and to two tails, right? H T T, T H T, and T T H, and then you have one for, uh, for three tails, right? So that would be the structure of it. And then you're here. Right, one, three, three, one. So yeah, we actually have have a tree. And what is this doing? It's actually structuring um, um, things that happen according to a tree, a vertical tree. I have to say, it's really something that goes down, and it's something that 
looks at ways, right? So it's a, it, these are like different ways of getting somewhere. This is like one one makes three, uh, one one two makes three, one one two makes three. All right, so there's different ways of getting at this position. So it's it's a, it's a structure of positions as well as ways, and I think that's that's the most important. So if we, if we have a position of two heads and a tail, there's three ways of getting to that position of three heads and a tail. If it's a, a game of three, uh, th uh, uh, three three rounds instead of five rounds, so that's it. This is a, a, a this Pascal's triangle is shows us how how there's actually a geometry and 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 and, and, and a, a way of calculating things happening, right? So that's really a, a change of uh, of of let's say the vagueness of uh, uncertainty to something that is as highly structured as probability. Right, there's a, a number of, of ways that things can happen. So that's that's the that's the the, the start of uh, probability. Now Leibniz also worked on that problem and on the estimation of the uncertain. It's not something he developed like very strongly, but he did. He does know a lot about, uh, of course, about com com combinatorics, right? But also about probability. So he's quite um, um, involved in, in the whole idea, though he doesn't really develop sort of the mathematics, right? He's famous for, uh, for calculus, differential calculus um, in mathematics, not so much for uh, how, how to calculate probabilities, but he does know his, uh, his, his way through, uh, through this problem. Um, on 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 the right side, uh, we get something that is uh, far more famous. It's, it's his philosophy of of existence, how things exist. Um, monadology. It's written in French. He would always write in French, not in German. And um, I'm 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 very interested in uh, in 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 why. Um, um, why this is important because um, it's it's the it's the moment where uh, um, he introduces uh, the idea of uh, what is called sufficient reason, and uh, sufficient reason is discussed uh, quite often in a, in a much larger uh, uh, context of Spinoza and, and and other philosophers that there must be a sufficient reason for things to occur, and. Uh, and of course, that that's in itself is correct, um, but it's Leibniz that actually uses uh, the word "sufficient" for the first time, and uh, that should ring a bell. That should ring a bell because uh, he was very involved in uh, in the discussion of efficacious and uh, and sufficient grace. He uses the word "sufficient grace" as a much earlier book, uh, Theodicy, on the problem of evil. Right, all theologists have to have to, uh, have to deal with this problem: how, how God and why God uh, uh, allows for evil to happen, which is, uh, from a theological point of view, the most complex uh, problem you can imagine. And he discusses uh, sufficient grace there, of course, and uh, that that makes sense because uh, sufficient grace is is called resistible grace. So to do evil means to resist grace. Uh, which makes sense. Um, so there's uh, there's two things that are important. Now um, let, let me see or uh, let me let's read this. Um, our reasonings are grounded upon two great principles: that of contradiction, which this is pure Aristotle, and, and of course in Aristotle it would be called non-contradiction. It's basically the same in virtue of which we judge false in uh, that which is involved a contradiction and true which is opposed or contradictory to the false right so and he, he refers actually to his earlier book paragraph 32 and that of sufficient reason in virtue of which we hold that there can be no fact real or existing 
no statement true unless there is a, be a sufficient reason. Why should it be so and not otherwise? Although these reasons usually cannot be known to us. Also referred to the theodicy. So uh, let's see. No fact, real or existing. So it's about facts. Um, that's that's already something. Uh, it's about facts. So you need to like. It doesn't talk about things. He talks about facts, uh, occurrences, and uh, and they need to be real or existing. And the statement about that fact, right? That's the second thing. So we have a fact that exists by itself, which is. Uh, debatable but and and then there's a statement about it which cannot be true unless there be a sufficient reason why it should be so and not otherwise and so or otherwise already means we're in this notion of a tree of of being or not being right so it, it exists it's non-contradictory right it, it's it the statement does not contradict um, but the statement needs to be discussing or explaining why it is so and not otherwise. Although these reasons usually cannot be known to us, that makes it a bit more complicated, but there must be sufficient reason for this, this statement. So it's about statements, it's about facts, it's about uh, they're true or not. Um, but it's supposed to be about sufficient reason. So what does this sufficient reason, um, the, why a thing is so, why it has happened means it's a sufficient cause, right? So it's, it's, about, it's about causality. And uh, it gets really interesting because causality being sufficient means it's a probable cause, right? So we have we are relating the idea of sufficient reason in two directions of, uh, of the thinking of Leibniz. One is that of sufficient grace and the other is to that of probability, the estimation of the uncertain. Right, so there would be a, 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 a distinction Right. It's not saying efficient causes. Efficient cause would be pure Aristotle. Right? That's a necessary cause. It's a necessary cause. That means there's an agency for the final cause, for something to get to. It's a, a purely singular uh, necessity, an entelechy. Uh, now, Leibniz is uh, strongly influenced by, uh, by uh, Aristotle, all, all his terminology, necessity, uh, contingency. These are all related to uh, to Aristotle. Uh, he calls uh, monads, entelechies, and final causes. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, referencing of Aristotle, but not not sufficient reason or sufficient causes. So I'm I'm putting the word sufficient reason on 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 two different sufficiencies. One is sufficient grace, and the other is su sufficient cause. So. Let's let's stay. We, I'm, we could follow the whole monodology. We're not going to do that. I'm, I'm just going to be like very interested in all, all, what that means, right? So and there's another Aristotelian argument, which is about predicates, and a predicate is something of a statement. So that's uh, um, uh, Aristotle would say Socrates is a man. Right, that's non-contradictory. It would be contradictory to say Socrates is a woman, though Jung would obviously deny that. But that for Aristotle, that would be a contradiction, and for Leibniz as well. So Socrates as a man is is necessarily true. Is necessarily true. And uh, we apply that to Caesar, of course, Aristotle would know Caesar, but now we're like in the hands of uh, Leibniz and Caesar is a man would be a, a necessarily true statement. This, and, and, uh, a predicate, right? it would be a predicate, and when it's necessarily true, it means it's substance. It belongs to the essence of, uh, of Caesar in this case, it belongs to his essence. Or, or substance, ousia, ousia, in in Greek, in uh, Aristotelian Greek. And now, what's interesting is that he 
he actually speaks about Caesar um, being all the things that he does, uh, and, and as as being part of of what he is. So, for instance, uh, what we see on the right, the crossing of the Rubicon, the famous moment uh, when he turns against Rome, right? It's like uh, and, and, f and fights that battle, and he wins the battle at Pharsalus. Uh, the, the famous moment that uh, that uh, Caesar decides to uh, like uh, uh, become the man uh, that he is, so to speak. Uh, the crossing of the, of the Rubicon, the alea yacta est, the die, the die is cast. So he crosses the Rubicon. He ta he makes a choice, right? It's very important to Leibniz. He makes a choice, and this choice is uh, part of the part of the subject. It's part of so the predicate can be contained in the subject. So it's just a this is a choice. So it's it's there's it's we are in the realm of chance, of probability, and um, um, it's just the realm of accident. And uh, accident in Aristotle is completely opposed to substance. And um, here we get uh, a philosopher of probability that says uh, actually that realm of uh, of of choice, of of chance, is is part of the of what in this case Caesar is right so it's it's though it might be contingently true that statement right so he might have done something else is actually part of his uh, part of his being part of his uh, substance now as long as that is not a contradiction as long as that's not a contradiction, this is a, is a sufficient reason to explain the character of uh, of of what Caesar is, or what makes out the essence or the substance of uh, of Caesar. Now we find other texts of uh, of of Leibniz. Uh, I'm going very quickly through because I'm I'm really just interested in this idea of sufficiency. Uh, he discusses, for instance, a theologist on uh, on sufficient grace, um, Stephen Nye, in this case, and he uh, makes a lot of notes in the book in the margins, and he gives it back. He actually borrows the book and uh, gives it back with all the notes in it. So uh, it has to be admitted that sufficient grace for those willing it is universal, and no one lacks it. But particular grace is something lacking, though it is the grace of willing, right? So particular grace is something lacking, but uh, such grace is, but such is the grace of willing. So, of course, we get this opposition of uh, of free will and grace, but there must be some kind of. Uh, of measuring effect. Now with the monads, this this actually becomes much more complex because uh, um, Leibniz is actually quite clear, and, and this it's a very radical theory of uh, of entities, um, which he he refers to uh, the the notion of atomism. Uh, he was very interested in uh, in early in, in early materialism of uh, Epicurus. Uh, Lucretius and uh, Democrates. This is the wrong uh, chronological order. Democrates came first, and then uh, Epicurus, and then Lucretius, which is a, a, a theory of atoms and voids. And uh, uh, but he actually moved away from from that type of materialism. But he wanted to invent an entity that actually contained um, uh, all the predicates. Uh, of things, so he's actually saying that a monad, a monad is actually the things that can happen to it, and the things that it might, that it that it may happen, but also that it might make happen. So we we can do things, we and we might do things, and. Others do things to us, and all those events 
because that's really what it is. It's, it's an understanding of things through events, a part of what a thing is, a part of what a thing is, because the predicates are part of the subject, right? The parts are, are part of it. They belong to it. I think that's what he says, they actually belong to it. So what he's doing is, uh, is if we go back to that idea of uh, of of a thing existing at a certain point and then the things that happen to it either through necessity or contingency or chance and the things that it might do all the way from uh, from what it did and and what it might have done are all part of that entity so we cannot s properly distinguish between accident and substance at this point and um, and that makes it a very important idea because um, it sort of closes the thing upon itself but this is a very important idea because if the things that happen to you in the range of probabilities and the things that you make happen also in the range of, the range of probability are basically all part of the same entity that means you become a closed system right you become a closed entity so that's why i highlighted here a moment then it's self-sufficient and it actually goes against causality right thus just like space and time cause and effect is a well-founded delusion so monad theory becomes so radical that it um, monadology it actually creates things as uh, as completely self-enclosed little universes now that little is a problem because um, uh, he is still in competition with atomism and he would speak about aggregates of of, of monads and uh, of course these aggregates are then in his mind are not monads anymore but on the other hand, he is discussing Caesar as, as self-sufficient, as 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 a monad, because uh, the, the things that happen to him and the things that he does and might have done, all within a specific range, right? Not infinite and uh, inf infinite amounts of uh, like things he could have done, are all part of him. They're necessarily true, so that makes make that entity of Caesar. Uh, obviously Caesar is much larger than an atom also a monad and uh, now this is interesting because uh, we get now a self-closed self-sufficient uh, well on the other page we got uh, a discussion of sufficiency so there is an incredible paradox here and of course we knew that already because uh, if free will is capable of transforming and, and somehow accepting or looping onto the things that happen to someone then that becomes self-closed right so now how does uh, Leibniz solve this well he solves it by putting all these monads in what he calls uh, a pre-established um, uh, harmony which is God right so there's still some room left but uh, I'm not really not really sure what that room is because uh, uh, it's quite clear that uh, 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 monads are uh, well uh, I would almost say autopoietic but uh, this is an extreme form of autopoiesis because it, it it's not just the material things that happen uh, to a thing it's all the perceptions and appetites i think that's where that's the clearest uh, opposition of uh, of uh, of atomism and uh, monadology or monadism um, is that uh, monads are not extended and their and their souls he calls them souls as well as entelechies and and they're actually um completely ordered on themselves uh, but they're made of appetites and perceptions uh, which is always the realm of consciousness so they're little blocks of consciousness 
uh, as well as entity. So it's it's as well a form of idealism as it, as it is a form of realism. It's just a pity that he, he could never sort of solve that that problem of uh, of um, uh, the sufficiency of grace uh, uh, external to a body as well as the sufficiency of grace that that makes a system look into itself because that's what it is let's not forget it uh, he did speak about uh, monas being laden with the past and 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 pregnant with the future right so laden with the past now laden is a term is a gravitational term and a pregnancy as well is it you you you're carrying a child um so we we have um, we have a structure of uh, of verticality of, of laden and pregnancy uh, things that befall and things that you make happen uh, which are connected or contracted into into what a thing is this, I, I don't think you can go further than this uh, of course with Simone Weil uh, there's a there's a there's a connection between these two um, uh, uh, but with Leibniz, uh, they're they're, they're uh, uh, linked through, through this idea of uh, of sufficiency. So what I'm going to try, and uh, this is a, just a simple attempt, is uh, is put, put two diagrams. Like the, the the one on the left you already know. It's just the, the, that's the diagram of the grace machine on the right. There is uh, how this picture, how this figure is constructed, but then understood from its own point of view. Um, uh, so this is a, a sort of overall view, and this this is something else. This is almost uh, this is the view of uh, well, what I would call I, I just put I, it's very embarrassing, but I, this is PSG a principle of sufficient grace. Um, as as related to the PSR, the, the principle of sufficient reason. So everything that's continuous here, everything that's continuous. Um, so that that realm of probability and this realm of probability, this realm of uh, the a priori, what happens to you, what is laden, um, and that thing of pregnancy, that what you make happen, what you can make happen, what you make happen, of agency, uh, all combined in this this posture, uh, all that make uh, makes out sort of the monad. But it's quite clear that they're open ended, right? It's uh, the, the, they're they're not linked; they're just being brought together through the notion of probability because this is a world of probability of, of, of a range of actions and this is a, a range of ha things that can happen to you right There's, everybody has a certain range of things that can happen and uh, a whole range of things that you you might do and uh, of course that, that, that this idea of a range of probabilities all contracted into what makes the substance of uh, in this case a person um now, I and mean, that means you're still in the realm of gravity. That means you're still in the realm of gravity, and of course, grace in the, in the idea of uh, of uh, both of Pascal and uh, and and Leibniz comes from above. And, then, and let's not forget that both have a, have a different idea of what how probability involves God. So. Um, for Pascal, uh, the, the belief in God, he calls it a wager. So you can, you can actually, uh, uh, it's actually safer to put uh, to put your money on the existence of God than 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 not, because uh, if you if you don't believe and God does not exist, you lose anyway. Right, and if you believe in God but He doesn't exist, you also lose. Right, but if you believe in God and He does exist, you you win. And there's that salvation for you. So he, for him, 
Like that's the world of probability. So, but, but probability in itself is not is not a theological. It's not part of the theological structure of, of Pascal's beliefs. Um, so for him, it's still efficacious grace, right? It's just like from from our point of view, uh, the wager um, is a, is a, is the smartest move uh, for for. Leibniz is different. Probability is part of 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 uh, of what God is. No, that, that, so there is an overlap. There is an overlap. So God must be involved in uh, in in this variability in this range of of what things that can happen to you. So uh, there's a there's a direct connection of what how God involves in this range is involved in that range. So there must be an overlap between sufficient grace and that self-sufficiency of the monad, right? This is very complicated uh, because God is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, has made the, the, the best of all possible worlds, he calls it, the best of all possible worlds. So again, this is an argument uh, of probability. So God has, a, has, has oversight as oversight, but not foresight in that sense. It's, it doesn't have the foresight of, of Augustine, but he has the oversight of all ranges and he chooses the best direction, right? So this is a very smart um, um, move of Leibniz. Um, so in that sense, he sort of um, steers around uh, uh, Augustine and, uh, and actually puts the ideas of Aquinas of sufficient grace like within the range of probability. So there must be an overlap of, of self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency and, and the sufficiency of, of God's grace. Now that's exactly what, what this diagram tries to show. It's like, yes, we need to link. Now, these are not by accident dashed lines, right? This is the, the, the dashed lines here are the same as the dashed lines here. This is like what, what we call the jump. So the void, the void that that um, the gap that I speak about here and the void that Simon Will talks about here are the same. It's positioned here, so this is a crossing of the void. And uh, so that uh, obviously you cannot will grace, right? So if this is grace, you cannot directly. This is not a continuous line. You cannot, and there's a range of options. There's a range of options, and um, and and of course, from the perspective here, when you receive grace, it seems to be coming from above, right? So this is a realm of transcendence. This is a realm of transcendence. So in that sense, Christianity is, is completely correct in its in the reading of it, of or the use of of the grace machine, right? The internal gap, the heart, and the external gap. As a realm of transcendence, it's just not something you can occupy, right? So it's it's as much uh, an act of of the self by losing the self. So here, there's still the self. There's the self with its free will, and here's a loss of self, and that allows for things to happen to you. Now. Let's let's see from the from the point of view of uh, of Simone Weil, um, that free will needs to then dissolve and become uh, instead of pure agency a form of uh, passive activity, where the two are combined. So the, there's patience and uh, agency. There's uh, patience itself is agent, and. Uh, which which he, which come from the Bhagavad Gita that she read is um, is um, this notion of a, which you can find a lot in uh, in Christianity, but you you find more of it in other religions. This this notion of uh, of stillness and uh, and and waiting. So there needs to be a transformation of of free will to what she calls this uh, attente, this waiting and attention. So and it's the same with Iris Murdoch, and, and that's also the moment of the reception of the good. 
right? So the, the, the idea of the good, that good things might happen to you, does not mean you're doing good things. You do good. It's, this is not this is not the realm of do-gooders. This this transformation of free will. Of course, do-gooders are still in the range of free will, but and to lose free will is not is not part of a do-gooders or doing good. Um, but you might argue for it uh, in another terminology. You might say yes. This there is a form of of doing good. But it doesn't mean there's a certain obedience to specific rules of do's and don'ts, which which allows you to like access this. So there's a specific form of attention, and we see that in, not only in Simone Weil, but also in, uh, for instance, Iris Murdoch. So there's this this notion of attention, and then the, this gap um, brings you to this sort of range of 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 what happens to you. So there's a certain acceptance. The acceptance of the void, this opening up, uh, also means that you're receptive. It's not just a generosity towards other things. It's also like an opening up to the generosity of other things that give themselves to you. So that, uh, and that, that might go pretty far because there are bad things that happen to you, right? So there's a, uh, there's diseases and all kinds of suffering that all fits sort of in this this realm of gravity that then needs to be accepted. Now we know that from many religions, so sort of this accepting of the void and this accepting of uh, of suffering. Um, there's also uh, 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 the, the idea of love. Um, it's very important to uh, Simone Weil because we can only uh, love God in, uh, in 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 His absence, right? So the, the, the God can only be present in His absence through our love. That's uh, that's the way we, we have contact with Him. So that's uh, that, that's as well. It's uh, that the attention is not. It's it's highly directed. Right, and it's a form of love. So the things that that will happen to you need to be loved, need to be received. And uh, though she was not a big fan of Nietzsche, this is actually a com completely uh, a, a Nietzschean idea. And uh, I I just have uh, one quote of uh, of Nietzsche because it is about love. Uh, is really fantastic and um, it's from the Friedrich Wissenschaft, from the Gay Science and it's uh, pretty late in the book, I think in the third part and it, it speaks about love and uh, very much in the same way as uh, Simone Weil does so, and he speaks about music and uh, how you train yourself and uh, he speaks about love and habit and uh, repetition pretty often in this book. And these are all interrelated. They're all interrelated. And uh, one, one must first learn to hear a melody at all, uh, and then detect and distinguish it, and isolate and delimit it. Then one needs effort and goodwill, guten willen, to stand it despite its strangeness. Goodwill is here. So free will. So we're going beyond free will, right? So we are not. We are not libertarians or uh, liberals in the in the European sense, right? The liberals in the U.S. Uh, so we can just uh, we we have, we find structures of of free will because that means free market. Uh, uh, so that's that's where it all ends, right? So this is um, uh, we, um, and the whole the whole grace machine is not about finding liberty. Um, it's really about finding um, grace or seeking grace, and um, seeking grace really means that what you do. What you make happen, this range is related to what happens to you. 
so how you carry yourself and what you have to bear and uh, so we can stand it despite its strangeness we hear patience with its appearance and expression and kind-heartedness kind-heartedness we are over here that's a, a, a gentleness is here so we have a gentleness even to the hardest things the, the worst things that can happen to you finally comes to a moment when you're used to it when we're used to it and then we expect it right? we are now in time we're now in the future when we sense it we'd miss it if we were missing and now it continuously relentlessly to compel and enchant us now it becomes to become radiant and charming until we have become its humble and enraptured enraptured lovers who no longer want anything better from the world than, than it again and again but this happens to us not only in music of course it is just in this way that we have learned to love everything we now love we are always rewarded in the end for our goodwill this is a beautiful term so it's, it's not the willing the good it's about goodwill that's a big difference our patience patience that's where we are here our fire-mindedness and gentleness is this, you know, this is incredibly beautiful with what is strange because at your point here it's they're still strange right as it gradually casts off its veil and presents us as a new indescribable beauty that is its thanks for our hospitality and this is this is pure gift gift theory right it, it, this is totally understanding this this self-sufficiency this self-sufficiency is now totally understood as as an internal gift cycle right this is an internal gift cycle so the sufficiency of grace and the sufficiency the self-sufficiency of an entity are now being overlapped it's like the heart and, and God in the notion of, uh, of, of Paul Nietzsche referred to Paul very often they're being overlapped right so the external gap and the internal gap are now the internal opening up and the external opening up are now being like um, aligned and overlapped superimposed with each other even he who loves himself will have learned this way there is no other way love too must be learned now what does this mean um let's go back here because it it it's this is um this is um it it comes from stoicism and 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 stoicism though it's i don't think it's a term that's ever been used by uh, uh people like epictetus um which is the term amor fati uh, which uh, Nietzsche uses very often um, uh, especially and he uses for the first time in um, in the Friedrich Wissenschaft so there, there's Amor Fati here uh, and what you force you would find in uh, in Stoicism is a certain tranquility um, is a tranquility of uh, Epictetus. I think he has the the, the, the analogy, the, the the allegory of the dog, right? The dog being uh, uh, bound to a cart that's being driven. So the, the dog resists and barks and whatever, has a horrible life. And he says, well, it's much better for the dog to actually yield and comply and accept its fate, accept its fate and uh, and internalize what happens to it right as a as a as a, as a tranquility um, now that that tranquility would in this in this schema would only bring you so far right because it's a form of patience but it's not love yet right so I think though a lot of people link Nietzsche's ideas of Amor Fati to to Epictetus and all the all the later Stoicists, I don't think it's correct. I think there's a the, the, the whole idea of ataraxia of tranquility in in uh, in in Stoicism is quite different than Amor Fati, which is a a, a missing uh, and and compelling and enchanting and, and ruptured love right so that and that sort of brings you here that that bring that actually closes the cycle 
so it's a self self giving so what happens to you is self given now obviously that this requires training and i think that's would be the comment on this because here habit in my earlier idea of, of habit and uh, aut uh, automatism there was a break and uh, there's uh, so there's this actually discontinuous so grace uh, yes it depends on habit but it also breaks away from it but i think this system actually makes clear that there is another type of habituation so the moment when you have learned this to actually sort of act through uh, certain ways and certain manners and gestures and postures and I think that would be the right way to discuss it on a human level this this notion of openness and uh, attention would actually refer back to habits right so there's not just a, an arrow in this direction there's an arrow going back there's an arrow going back that actually transforms and regulates and resets these habits and he actually calls that second nature so you have to that you have to understand Nietzsche as um, I know we could talk about this for hours, of course, but and I want to just discuss it in a specific structure. And I, I want to sort of pay my debts to the to the ideas of uh, Simone Weil. But it, this you could structure this whole diagram uh, through through what what Nietzsche is talking about. Nietzsche talks a lot about gravity in Zarathustra, right? There's this 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 uh, this. Uh, this, I think that's what he speaks about this this creature sitting on his shoulder uh, feeding him with lead thoughts right heavy thoughts and we have to invent a new gravity that's what he says a neue Schwerkraft um, and um, so th th this notion of self-transcendence uh, is, this is so difficult because um, there's a self and the self is doing what the self does and then he the self transcends him, himself and then adapts so it is a very therapeutical machinery but it's a, it's highly questionable if you can call this whole system a self because there would be a double contour there's a singular contour and this is already a contour that's being completely blown up, right? So this one would be your normal, normal libertarian contour, right? Of a, a, an entity who does things of free will in a sort of free world, free uh, that makes the world a market, obviously. Um, uh, well, this world is not a market. This is really a much more uh, a, a world organized by the gift cycle. It's uh, a quite. <laughs> quite a different idea obviously um, maybe it's not a world of liberty but of uh, fraternity but uh, I'm not sure what kind of community this is the community of limbs um, but it, it is it is a perfect overlap of self-sufficiency but it's self-sufficiency is not a sufficiency of the self and I think that's that's why that's why uh, Nietzsche involves not only love but also beauty and uh, so we because of course we need the things we love are beautiful I mean Plato and Socrates already said that the thing uh, I mean we don't love ugly things we love beautiful things um, so be beauty is involved here as well and uh, he speaks about having, having beauty, beauty not once but twice or even thrice Right, that's the famous translation of Kaufman, and uh, this loop becomes the eternal recurrence. It's uh, it's it's this. He speaks about this looping, um, this training, this training, um, uh, and there must be a flexibility here of trying out various good wills, and uh, good wills are are not doing goods. And, and love and the, and the structuring of this self-transcending feeding back on the self and how this thing as a whole uh, uh, 
sort of stabilizes. Uh, and that can mean death. It, this is uh, it, it's salvation is not, and I think uh, um, Simone Weil would agree here. It is, it is, uh, um, salvation does not mean a, a denial of death. It actually means accepting uh, death. Um, all kinds of diseases. Um, how do they become acceptable? Well, that requires a lot of training, but there, there, there is an acceptance of finitude that requires a, a sort of second contour or, or a, 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 a second finitude, not an infinity, but a, a second finitude, a second contour that may, of course makes things radiate. Um, but that's sort of about it. That's sort of about it. <laughs>